and it's out of need. Thank you. That ends general question time. I am very sad to have to inform the Chamber of the passing of our dear friend and colleague Brian Adam this morning. Our flags are already being flown at half-mast. Parliament will debate a motion of condolence next week when members will have an opportunity to pay full tribute to Brian. There will, always, there will also be a book of condolence available after FMQs today in the black and white corridor, and I know members will wish to add their contribution to it. Today, however, our thoughts are with his wife Dodie and Brian's family. First Minister. for the uh, information, the sad news that you have given us and the way you have done it. Uh, Brian Adams is an exceptional MSP. He was one of the absolutely crucial people who did what many thought was impossible in sustaining a minority government as Chief Whip. I was delighted to see him serve as a minister in this parliament. Of course, his greatest service to the, was to the people of Aberdeen over a quarter of a century, first as a councillor and then as an MSP. I am proud to say that I have known and admired him over that entire period as an outstanding politician, a fine human being and a dear friend. Our condolences, and I know this is shared by every single member in this chamber, I go to his wife Dodie and the five children, Neil, Jamie, Sarah, David and Alan. It was for them, obviously, the most difficult time of all. We move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Marmont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I, on behalf of my party, my colleagues here, and indeed all of those who are no longer with us but served in the Parliament since 1999, say that we are deeply saddened by the news that Brian Adam has passed away. I have always recognised in him a man of strong conviction, of decency, of profound faith, a man who cared deeply for his family, his party and his country. Our thoughts are with those who feel his loss most sorely. And I know this is a very sad day indeed for those here who not only knew I had the privilege of working with him as a colleague, but loved him as a friend. We share your sadness at the loss of a fine parliamentarian and a fine Scot. And can I ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Hey, can I thank uh, Joanne Lamont for the, the way she has uh, expressed sympathy to, to Brian's uh, family and friends. And uh, later today, uh, we will carry forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If Scotland votes yes in the referendum, the first budget of an independent Scotland will be set in 2016. Who would the First Minister prefer to sign it off? Ed Balls, George Osborne or Angela Merkel? No, the first, first budget, uh, and I must not pick the Cabinet in advance, and I must not say in advance if the Scottish people, but if the Scottish people back the Scottish National Party and the way things stand us now, that first budget will be set by John Swinney. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joanne well, we all know that is not true, given what has been said in the last week. And despite the fact that they have deployed the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, and indeed John Swinney himself, they have been unable to answer the very simple question about implications for Scotland being in a sterling zone. Now, I agree with the First Minister that George Osborne is a slippery, untrustworthy man. I just do not understand why he thinks that it is going to change after the referendum. I agree that George Osborne's fiscal and monetary policies are wrong for Scotland and indeed the whole of the United Kingdom. But it is Osborne the First Minister will do the deal with if he wins the referendum. And that's the difference between Alex Salmond and me. I want to get rid of the Tories and keep the Union. He wants rid of the Union and to keep the Tories in charge of the economy. Can the First Minister explain to me and perhaps some of his colleagues why that would be independence? First Minister. Uh, can I point out that somewhere in that question, Joanne Lamont seemed to concede the first uh, elections to an independent Scottish Parliament. Uh, if that is the case, <laughs> then I, I, I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, can, I, can I point out that the, uh, the arguments for uh, uh, a sterling area were set out in enormous detail by the, uh, the Fiscal Commission some weeks ago? And we can point out that uh, on the basis of last year's figures, for example, uh, the four billion relative surplus that Scotland had compared to the UK Treasury, the ample room for manoeuvre. Would that we had the ability now to generate that income which Scotland has generated and use it to benefit the people of Scotland. That is the sort of flexibility over taxation and spending that Scotland would have as an independent country. Joanne Lamont is in the unfortunate position that even when she proposes 
uh, an increase in flexibility over fiscal policy, like control of income tax. The Members of Parliament at Westminster, who she is meant to control, uh, describe it as being dead in the water. It doesn't even get discussed at the conference. So perhaps it is not surprising that Joanne Lamont is apparently conceding the first elections uh, for an independent Scottish Parliament. I, I think the Labour Party, Joanne Lamont, should try harder to unite with their own MPs. <laughs> instead of uniting with George Osborne, that slippery character in the Better Together campaign. Joanne Lamont, well, that felt like an infestation of squirrels, I have to say. <laughs> because we now seem to be in a position that we no longer cry freedom, we cry, we cry flexibility, whatever that might mean. And the First Minister has yet to answer a simple question about the implications of his choice with no plan B for the currency. Because, of course, John Swinney told the BBC Scotland might leave the United Kingdom without paying any debts at all. It seems that while there are some who say an independent Scotland might end up like Greece, John Swinney wants us to start off like Greece by defaulting on our debts. Four weeks ago, four weeks ago, four weeks ago, I asked the First Minister what his plan B was if we couldn't agree on a currency union. Like George Osborne, he said there was no plan B. So is his strategy to say, let us enter currency union or we won't pay our debts? And if that fails, wouldn't Sam and Scotland start off life as an international pariah without a currency? First Minister. Uh, our position, uh, as set out in the Fiscal Commission's uh, report, that, that, that Scotland is entitled to uh, a share of the assets proportionate to the United Kingdom and the liabilities of the United Kingdom. That is the responsible position we put forward. As Mervyn King said in front of the, the committees of the uh, House of Commons, that the Bank of England is not just the Bank of uh, London, it is the Bank of Scotland and the rest of the UK. But John Swinney was pointing out, and it is a realistic point to, to make, that if George Osborne says that all of the monetary assets belong to him, belong to the London government, then by definition, as night follows day, yeah. if you pursue that argument, then so do the liabilities. <laughs> and people may have noticed that George Osborne and Alistair Darling between them have piled up an enormous number of liabilities <laughs> over the last few years. See, Joanne Lamont criticises the Conservative Party. Can I just say to her, it is kind of difficult to do that when you're in alliance with the Conservative Party. You can't say you don't like what George Osborne is doing to Scotland and then campaign shoulder to shoulder with him in the Better Together campaign. And we've got the remarkable position that Alistair Darling, the leader of the Better Together campaign, says you mustn't believe a single thing that George Osborne says. Nothing he says, he said it on Saturday, has any credibility. Nothing he says has any credibility. George Osborne says about Alistair Darling that anything he said hasn't got credibility. Politically, he's a dead man walking. So these two people who don't believe in each other's credibility are the ones who take to Scotland what we can't do. We can be an independent country with control over our resources and taxation, and that will make Scotland much better off than the Better Together campaign would ever manage. The First Minister talks about credibility. He changes his position in a currency more time than I change my shoes. It's the only consistent thing about his position in the currency is that it is not consistent. He doesn't say the same thing from one week to another. And he talks about building up liabilities. Yes, we remember how we built up those liabilities, saving the Royal Bank of Scotland, the bank that the First Minister used to work for. And if you don't have a plan B, you can boil down the First Minister's position as simply this. Please, Goni, please, let us be in a currency union with no credibility about what you would take into that negotiation. But clearly, in the First Minister's last response, the First Minister clearly doesn't understand why this matters. He thinks it's a bit of a game, a bit of a knockabout. But it matters to families worrying about what currency their wages will be paid in and how they'll put food on the table. It matters to pensioners who are entitled to know how their pension will be paid. It matters to the person who has saved all of their lives and who now wonders what those savings will be worth if there is a yes vote. It matters to anyone paying off a mortgage, to anyone in a job, anyone with a business, 
The currency we have is a most basic question, and it is astonishing the First Minister has been unable to answer it. But pause. What the First Minister is saying is he wants a divorce, but to keep the joint bank account. Isn't he gambling with Scotland's future on the goodwill of neighbours we'd have just rejected? First Minister. You know, the, when we published the uh, report to the Fiscal Commission Working Group, uh, as an extensive document put forward in enormous detail why we think it was in the interest of Scotland to have a sterling area after independence and why it was overwhelmingly in the interest of the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, that is a whole range of points uh, about trade flows between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, but probably the most substantial point is that Scottish resources which bankroll the sterling area. £50 billion. Pounds. What on earth? would happen to sterling if that were outside the sterling area. Therefore, we're not depending on the goodwill or munificence, just the obvious economic self-interest, the overwhelming self-interest of the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, we can't, uh, uh, well, that's perhaps why, when asked four times on Newsnight if he was ruling it out, the Chancellor refused to rule it out. Danny Alexander was asked simultaneously almost four times on the other programme, and he refused to rule it out. Now, John Lambert says she doesn't know the SNP's position. I've just set out what the SNP's position is. What is the Labour's position? You see, never mind uh, Alistair Darling, Ken McIntosh on Newsnight, the 30th of May 2012, said to Gordon Brewer, remember the five tests for joining the Euro. Gordon Brewer, yes, that's still Labour's. Do you still have these five tests? Five tests to join the Euro? Certainly, said Ken McIntosh. <laughs> so maybe she should bring her own finance spokesman into line, never mind the MAPs at Westminster. And then, of course, we have uh, perhaps an a independent adjudication of these matters. So let's turn to David Blanchfer, former member of the Monetary Policy Committee, appointed by a Labour government. Quote, this week, there are no major obstacles at all to a currency union if both sides acted with an open mind. The UK government have just made it up. It's more political than economic. <laughs> it's certainly pretty likely, given how disastrous George Osborne has been, that if Scotland had their own fiscal policy, they'd have done better. Osborne lecturing the Scots in economics is like a freshman who failed Economics 101, giving the keynote address to the American Economic Association. <laughs> I agree with David Blanchfeller, the eminent economist that the Labour Party appointed to the Monetary Policy Committee. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to associate myself and my party with the tributes paid to Brian Adam. Too often people only see the conflict in this parliament, they don't see the camaraderie. And Brian Adam had friends on all sides of this chamber. He took great pride in serving the people of Aberdeen, first as a councillor and then as a parliamentarian. And he did so with diligence and with decency. The thoughts of everybody on this side of the chamber are with his family, with his friends and with his colleagues at this time. And I would like to ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. Thank. Can I thank uh, Ruth Davidson for her, her generous tribute, which will be much appreciated uh, by, Brian's, uh, by Brian's family. Uh, I have no plans uh, in the near future. Ruth Davidson. President Officer, the uh, First Minister seemed very keen to use quotations just a, a second ago. I'd like to, if I may gently remind him of his own words uh, in November 1999, when he said, the pound sterling has been a millstone around Scotland's neck, costing Scotland jobs and prosperity. Ten years later, he said, we're in sterling and sterling is sinking like a stone. He's also said, we cannot allow ourselves to be held back by clinging on to sterling. Can I ask at what point in the First Minister's political journey the pound sterling stopped being a millstone uh, and started being a life raft? <laughs> First Minister. Well, can I point out that Ruth Davidson, in, in alliance uh, with Danny Alexander, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, is in alliance with the, the person who was the leader of the pro-Euro campaign. Uh, when I've been in Parliament, the Conservative Party were yeah, making yeah. plans to yeah. join the Euro. Yeah. I seem to remember, I don't think Ken Clark has ever revoked his okay. support for the Euro. She's in alliance with Alistair Darling, who was in support of the yeah. Euro. So I'm merely pointing out that the consistent thread of the SNP, unlike the other parties, is we put forward what is in the economic interests of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. 
that's the basis of the Fiscal Commission Working Group, and that's the basis on which the SNP and the Scottish Government will always act. The difficulty for Westminster Government is more than often, very often, the interests of Scotland are very, very far from the top of their agenda. Ms Davidson. It's not like the First Minister to be shy in just telling us. It's when a, a more fiscally responsible Conservative government came in in 2010, isn't it? Um, let's, leave, let's leave the bluff and bluster and whatever that answer was supposed to be aside. Because the First Minister has already this week had the UK Chancellor, the former Bank of England experts, Professor Charles Nolan and John Nugy, telling him it would be unbelievably difficult to secure his preferred choice of a sterling zone. And he's even had his own former economic advisor, Professor John Kay, saying he should expect to fail in his negotiations. Uh, indeed, politically, his fellow separatists, Margot MacDonald, Jim Sillers, Patrick Harvey, have all said independence should mean Scotland having its own currency. We know that this First Minister is a gambler, we know he's reckless, but is he honestly telling Scotland that he would enter negotiations with no bargaining position and no backup plan? Oh, OK. Order! Oh, oh, I'll ask. I will ask the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister to tell us what the plan B is then. Is it to use sterling anyway, as Ecuador uses the US dollar, or is it a separate currency, as his economic adviser suggests, the Bob E? First Minister. Well, the, the bargaining position is £50 billion pounds of Scottish assets which underpin the UK economy. You know, we've got a Conservative Party who are celebrating it because over the last six months, UK GDP has flatlined entirely. A Chancellor who's playing with fire, according to the International Monetary Fund, who's been downgraded in two of the three rating agencies, and yet the Better Together campaign are still delivering leaflets saying that you've got to maintain AAA status by voting for the union. When we publish a report, with great respect, two Nobel laureates and a professor of economics at Harvard, which sets out in the most enormous detail the arguments for a sterling area, then we do expect, at the very least, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to have read the report, because in the middle of his four times refusing to rule out the idea of a sterling zone, Danny Alexander said the arguments hadn't been put forward. The arguments were put forward in enormous detail in this report, and maybe it's high time that the Better Together campaign started reading and stop delivering leaflets claiming an AA status. Ruth Davidson is the representative of a party. No. Exactly. I'm anticipating the next report from Moody's, which will take it down. There they are. The downgraded party in Scotland defending the downgraded Chancellor. We defend the interests of Scotland in the knowledge that Scottish resources are our bargaining position. I have a constituency question. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer to ask the First Minister what help can be offered to 70 employees who risk losing their jobs following the liquidation of Ice Tech Freezer Factory in Caithness this week after 40 years of production, first under Norfrost and since 2005 with John G. Russell. First Minister. Well, I share the constituency members' deep concern in respect of this development at Ice Tech and the impact, of course, on the employees affected, their families and, of course, the whole Caithness area. I confirm that we are doing continue everything we possible to support these employees through the Partnership for Continuing Employment Initiative. Skills Development Scotland have acted immediately to organise a PACE redundancy support event for Friday the 3rd of May in the Pentland Hotel in Thurso. All employees will receive an invitation to this event where PACE partnership organisations will be present to supply every support possible to the individuals concerned. I will be delighted if the constituency member would like to, to meet with the Finance Secretary to discuss these important matters for me. Question number three, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on reports that nurses spend around 279,000 hours a week on non-essential paperwork. First Minister. Well, we are working with health boards and staff representatives, including, of course, the RCN, to ensure that frontline national health staff can focus on delivering high-quality patient care to drive improvement. This includes working to reduce paperwork requirements, particularly for senior charge nurses, so we can maximise their role as clinical leaders and guardians of patient safety. The Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing has recognised this as a priority, which the RCN, of course, has welcomed. Jack Bailey. 
and I thank the First Minister for his response. But in the week that nurses warned about the dramatic increase in paperwork, taking them away from direct patient care, both the Royal College of Nurses and Unison warned the Scottish Government about unsafe staffing levels, with 27% of nurses saying that staffing levels are rarely or never safe. Would the First Minister agree that cutting 2,000 nurses from the NHS to the lowest level since the SNP came to power is having a negative impact on patient care? And will he therefore agree to look again at workforce planning to reverse the cuts in nurse numbers so that we do provide the very best possible patient care? First Minister. Well, uh, as uh, the, the member well knows, the protection of the budget of the National Health Service, both in the 2007 election and again in the 2011 election, was one of the pledges made by this SNP government, which we have kept to. That pledge, in the run-up to the elections at least, was not made by the Labour Party. So we can get to the conclusion that National Health Service is better funded than it would have been if the Scottish people had voted otherwise. Nor is she totally accurate in terms of the statistics she's giving. If we look at qualified nurses and midwives, in September 2007 there were 37,549. September 2006 there was 41,026. There are now 41,745. She shall also be aware that per thousand of population, Scotland has the highest number of qualified nurses in any of the countries in these islands. It's an indication that we know there are huge pressures in the National Health Service. Of course there are. How could there be otherwise in current circumstances? But both in terms of the budget that's been devoted and our commitment to patient care, the National Health Service and the nurses of Scotland are doing an outstanding job. Question number four, John Wilson. I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent report by the Treasury regarding Scottish banknotes in an independent Scotland. First Minister. Well, the uh, threat by the UK Government uh, to Scottish banknotes is quite simply uh, ridiculous. The bogus claims completely ignore the fact that the Scottish banknote issue is not backed by the Bank of England, it is backed by balances held on a one-to-one -one basis at the Bank of England. Uh, so, therefore, if I can quote uh, uh, Professor Blanchfer once again, ex-member of the Monetary Policy Committee, who on this issue said, I don't see it as a big problem. It's not a major precedent. I do think it's a great deal of scaremongering. There's not a great deal of economics going into this. John Wilson. Thank you, the First Minister, for his reply. The Treasury economic framework with respect to currency choices, known as the optimum currency area, seems to be at variance with the Banking Act of 2009, which secures the distinct status of Scottish banknotes. Does the First Minister agree with me that George Osborne's blunder into this issue represents no more than scaremongering, as he's just commented, and will he join with me in inviting the Chancellor to make many more visits to Scotland in the coming months, as this can only increase the prospects for a yes vote in September 2014? First Minister. Well, uh Many people will remember, I think it was 18 months ago, that George Osborne played a visit to Scotland and said the constitutional debate was damaging inward investment. And he said he thought about companies, they couldn't name them where this was the case. Since then, of course, Scotland has topped the league in investment, inward investment, over the last two years, greater even than London in the last year. So we've had George Osborne's scaremongering before. But in terms of the reaction of the Scottish people, I think the member is absolutely correct. I think a Tory Chancellor coming to Scotland and talking down the country and telling us what we can't do is exactly the sort of stimulus that the Yes campaign needs. I agree in terms of the issue with James Scott, former the Scottish Financial Enterprise Director, this bogus assertion by the Treasury okay. should be treated with the contempt it deserves. And therefore, I think we can make an offer to George Osborne. Let's pay his bus fare <laughs> in coming to Scotland to sink the No campaign. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the securing the future of Scottish banknotes or any other favourable terms of a currency union with sterling might well be possible, might even be in Scotland's and the rest of the UK's interests. But how can we possibly be in a strong enough position to negotiate those favourable terms if the government has closed down the other option of a genuinely independent currency? 
First Minister. Well, the, the Fiscal Commission put forward what we think is in the best interest of Scotland. The Scottish Government has responded by uh, accepting uh, its conclusions. But can I just point out that the, the note issue scaremongering story was particularly extraordinary. Uh, the Isle of Man issues sterling notes backed by balances at the Bank of England. It's not even in the United Kingdom at the present moment. And the importance of this uh, is, of course, if you can identify beyond any reasonable argument of the total scaremongering basis of one of the canards of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, then it probably follows that Alistair Darling was correct in saying that nothing that George Osborne says has any credibility. Question number five, Jenny Mara. To ask the First Minister what the implications are for scientific evidence in courts following the appeal court ruling in the Kimberley Haney case. First Minister. Well, the, the member will be aware of the adverse press coverage in relation to the two expert witnesses, Professor Sue Black and Dr Craig Cunningham, where it was reported wrongly in some newspapers the appeal court had referred to these two witnesses in derogatory terms. The member may be aware that the judiciary have issued a statement correcting this interpretation, and I have placed a copy of that statement in spice. The reputation of expert witnesses is very important indeed, and I know that Professor Sue Black and Dr Craig Cunningham are held in the highest regard. Professor Sue Black, of course, has an international reputation based on her work in Kosovo and elsewhere and around the globe. Forensic anthropology as a whole is a very important scientific discipline, which is an important role to play in many criminal cases. Jenny Mara. Thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, Professor Sue Black said this week that the comments made by the appeal court judge in this case took science and the law back 100 years in Scotland. Yesterday's apology was welcome, but it would be good if we could make some advances to better understanding between science and the law as a result of this appeal. Will the First Minister ask the Cabinet Secretary to meet with the Law Society to take forward training for legal diploma students and the wider judiciary? Will he consider a adopting the English Law Commission's proposals on expert evidence and the appointment of scientific advisers to Scottish courts? And will the First Minister meet with me, Professor Sue Black, and her colleagues from the scientific community in Scotland to discuss how our legal system may be better served through improved scientific understanding? First Minister. Yeah, well, I think the, the statement made by the judiciary is, is very important indeed, uh, and I think it should be taken full account of. And, uh, that is exactly why I am placing it in spice. But can I just say on this wider issue in terms of criminal procedures and admissibility of uh, expert evidence, the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 contains these procedures for raising concerns of expert evidence by way of preliminary hearings and rulings. It is important that both prosecution and defence have access to the best experts in the field and expert evidence can be rigorously tested through the court process. The system is flexible enough to deliver this. That is within the system at the present moment. Uh, but, of course, given the appeal court's ruling, uh, that it is perfectly in order for the judiciary as a whole to consider what the appeal court has said uh, to see if the rules of court need to be altered in any way uh, in terms of giving that provision, which is already within the criminal law of Scotland, its full emphasis and importance. And in terms of the, if the meetings after the statement of the judiciary uh, are necessary, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would be uh, delighted to, uh, to meet the expert witnesses concerned. Question number six, Jim Thank Officer, to ask the First Minister what discussion the Scottish Government has had with or representations it has made to Ofgem regarding the proposed new tariff comparison rate. First Minister. Well, the, the Deputy First Minister has responded to Ofgem's consultation on the retail market review proposals in December. The proposed tariff comparison rate is one of a number of proposals aimed at providing clear and simple information for consumers. We recognise these proposals are a step forward in encouraging and promoting consumer engagement in the market, and therefore we support the work of Ofgem to simplify tariffs. However, I would say in taking this work forward, Ofgem must ensure that proposals are effective in ensuring that consumers, particularly those who are vulnerable, to fuel poverty can secure the best energy deal. I thank the First Minister for that answer. But does he agree that far too many people in energy-rich Scotland still live in fuel poverty and that the public are right to expect effective regulation so that energy suppliers serve the needs of the people rather than the needs of shareholders? First Minister. 
Well, I do agree that energy suppliers must serve the, the needs of the public, and I also agree with the Joe Media that it is a disgrace that an energy-rich Scotland, uh, a country which we now know has contributed above average in terms of contributions to the UK Treasury for every single one of the last 32 years. Uh, we still have fuel poverty in a country with such resources and riches. In terms of what the Scottish Government is doing, last month we announced £60 million of funding for local authorities to transform thousands of properties across Scotland, and also the £32 million extension to the energy assistance package, which will help secure free insulation and heating for more than 300,000 uh, households. These are steps forward in what is a, a very difficult situation facing many of our fellow citizens. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. Can I remind members who leave in the Chamber that there is a book of condolence in the Black and White Lobby. The next item of business is a business debate on motion number 5930 in the name of John Pentland on Workers Memorial Day 2013. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put.